So this slide looks at virus structure. So viruses vary in this structure. A virus particle is made up of a nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, surrounded by a protective protein coat known as a capsid. The DNA or RNA can be single or double stranded. The shape of the capsid can vary from one virus type to another, and we'll talk about the different shapes of capsids later on. As we mentioned, viruses are not cells, and the capsid is not filled with cytosol and organelles, but it contains the genome and a few enzymes to direct the synthesis of new viral particles called virions. The capsid is made up of protein subunits called capsomeres. And the capsid serves to protect and introduce the genome into host cells. For some viruses, the capsid is surrounded by a lipid bilayer, which are called enveloped viruses. So enveloped viruses. The viral envelope is a small portion of phospholipid membrane obtained from host cells during vi virion budding. So budding is one mechanism by which virions can be released from the host cell. Budding ultimately results in pin the pinching off of the virion from the host membrane. Other viruses are formed from only a nucleic acid and capsid, and these are called naked or non-enveloped viruses. So some naked viruses and enveloped viruses have spikes, which are proteins which extend outward and away from the capsid, and these help in host invasion. They help to bind to the host cell. Influenza viruses are often identified by their H&N spikes, e.g. H1N1 flu viruses. So you can see examples of these spikes here. So at the top we have the atenovirus, which is a naked virus, so it doesn't have that lipid envelope. So the spikes are attached directly to the capsid, and these spikes bind the the atenovirus to host cells. And then at the bottom you've got an enveloped virus, okay, so that's the HIV virus which is surrounded by the lipid envelope, and this uses the spikes embedded in the envelope to bind to host cells. So viruses vary in the shape of their capsids. The capsids can be helical, polyhedral or complex. Helical capsids are shaped like hollow tubes with protein walls. The tobacco mosaic virus, TMV, is a well-studied example of the helical capsid structure. The capsid of the TMV virus contains uh, the RNA genome, which is wound in a spiral and lies within a groove formed by the protein subunits. And at the bottom left of the slide, you can see the helical capsid structure. Polyhedral viruses consist of nucleic acids surrounded by a polyhedral or many-sided capsid, usually in the form of an icosahedron. Icosahedrons are 3D, 20-sided structures with 12 vertices. So what do we mean by vertices? Well, vertices is the plural to vertex, which is a point where two or more line segments meet. So icosahedrons have 12 vertices. And we can see the icosahedral structure at the bottom right of the slide. So certain types of viruses have complex shapes. For example, certain types of bacteriophages and pox viruses may have features of both polyhedral and helical viruses, so are described as complex in shape. Bacteriophages have their genome located within the polyhedral head and the sheath connects the head to the tail fibres and tail pins help the virus to attach to receptors on the host cell surface. Pox, pox viruses are also complex shapes. They're brick shaped with complicated surface characteristics not seen in the other categories of capsid. So if you look at the bottom of the slide, A and B are showing bacteriophage and C is showing the pox viruses. So in biology, taxonomy is the scientific study of naming, defining and classifying groups of biological organisms. So according to the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses, viral family names end in viridae, for example, parvoviridae, and the genus names end in virus, for example, parvovirus. Genus and species are used together, such as Pandora virus dulcis. The most commonly used system of virus classification was developed by the Nobel Prize winner David Baltimore in the early 1970s 
and he classified viruses according to their genome. So whether they had DNA or RNA, single or double stranded, and also how the mRNA is produced during the replicative cycle of the virus. The, character, the characterization of the genome of a ssRNA virus is further differentiated by the sense of the ssRNA. That is, whether the genome is identical to or complementary to the mRNA produced by the virus. So ssRNA viruses with an RNA genome that is identical to that of the mRNA it produces are said to have plus strand or positive strand RNA genomes. Other ssRNA viruses have genomes that are complementary to the mRNA that they produce. These viruses are said to have minor strand or negative strand RNA. And then aside from formal systems of nomenclature, viruses can also be informally grouped into categories based on chemistry or morphology, such as size, structure, shape, or based on other characteristics that they share in common. So this table shows common pathogenic viruses categorized according to their genome and whether they're surrounded by an envelope. So as you can see, the double-stranded DNA viruses include pox viruses, herpes viruses, and adenoviruses. And with these double-stranded virus, DNA viruses, the, the mRNA is transcribed directly from the DNA template. So with double-stranded DNA viruses, the mRNA is transcribed directly from the DNA template. Then we have examples of single-stranded DNA viruses, such as the parvoviruses. And with these single-stranded DNA viruses, the DNA is first converted to double-stranded DNA before the mRNA is transcribed. Then we have an example of a double-stranded RNA virus. So the rotavirus is the example shown here. And with these double-stranded RNA viruses, mRNA is transcribed from the RNA genome. Then we have the positive single-strand RNA viruses. And with these, the genome functions as the mRNA. An example shown here is the rhinovirus responsible for the common cold. So with the positive single-strand RNA, the genome functions as the mRNA. And then we have the negative single-strand RNA viruses. And with these viruses, the mRNA is transcribed from the RNA genome. The examples shown here include flu viruses. So as we said previously, viruses rely on host cells for reproduction and metabolic processes. And viruses themselves don't encode all the enzymes necessary, but they can use host cell machinery to produce more viral particles. And that's the virions we were talking about. Bacteriophages, which are the viruses which infect bacteria, these replicate only in the cytoplasm, since prokaryotes do not have a nucleus. In eukaryotic cells, most DNA viruses can replicate inside the nucleus, with an exception observed with the large DNA viruses such as pox viruses, and these can replicate in the cytoplasm. RNA viruses that infect animal cells often replicate in the cytoplasm. So the life cycle of bacteriophages is a good model for understanding how viruses affect host cells. So you have the vir virulent phages, and these lead to cell death through cell lysis. And then you have the temperate phages, and these become part of the ho host chromosome and replicate with the cell genome until they are induced to make newly assembled viruses or progeny viruses. So this slide looks at the lytic cycle of the virulent phage. There are five stages in the bacteriophage lytic cycle. Attachment is the first stage in the infection process in which the phage interacts with specific receptors on the bacteria surface, for example, LPS. The second stage of the infection is entry or penetration. And this occurs through contraction of the tail sheath, which acts as a needle to inject the viral genome through the cell wall and membrane. The phage head and remaining components remain outside the bacteria. Then the third stage of infection is biosynthesis of new viral components. After entering the host cell, the virus synthesizes virus-encoded endonucleases to degrade the bacterial chromosome. 
It then hijacks, hijacks the host cell to replicate, transcribe and translate the necessary viral components for the production of new viruses. Then during the fourth stage, the maturation phase, new virus particles or virions are created. Then to liberate the new phages, the bacterial cell wall is disrupted by phage proteins. The fifth and final stage then is lysis, where the new phages burst out the host cell and are released into the environment to infect new cells. So as we said previously, temperate phages are able to undergo lysogeny. And a prime example of a phage with this type of life cycle is lambda phage. So during this cycle, this lysogenic cycle, the phage genome integrates into the bacterial chromosome and becomes part of the host genome. The integrated phage genome is called a prophage, and therefore a bacterial host with a prophage is called a lysogen. It is typical of temperate phages to be latent or inactive within the cell. The presence of, the presence of phage may actually alter the phenotype of the bacterium. For example, toxin genes can increase bacterial virulence. And this process is called lysogenic or phage conversion. So next we're going to look at this lysogenic cycle in more detail. So similarly to the lytic cycle, in the lysogenic cycle, the phage genome also enters the host cell through attachment and penetration. However, during the lysogenic cycle, instead of killing the host, the phage genome integrates into the bacterial chromosome and becomes part of the host. Then as the bacterium replicates its chromosome, it also replicates the, phag the phage's DNA and passes it on to new daughter cells during reproduction. Now this can continue for many generations until there is exposure to stresses, for example, UV light or changes in growth conditions. Then under these stressful conditions, prophage DNA is excised or removed from the bacterial chromosome. The lysogenic cycle then ends and the lytic cycle begins.